You heard the president there saying that he will ensure free, fair, and credible elections in 2023. He went further in that conversation to say anyone who wants to contest must work hard as he will not condone anyone using the name of his office to canvass for support. The question out there is, is it within the uh, powers of the president to enforce that, to assure us of this or the place of INEC? Of course, he has also talked about law enforcement agents doing their job to ensure free, fair, and credible elections come 2023. For them, we have a number of elections before that time. What are some of the elements that are likely to play out for the president to fulfill this promise? To have this conversation with us, we have uh, uh, a legal practitioner and former second vice president of the NBA, Mr. Moliobani. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Hiya, thank you for having me. So, what's your take on the president's promise? You know, in law, uh, when you sue as a claimant, uh, the defendant will ask you to provide what you call further and better particulars. In other words, uh, if you have given information that is clearly incomplete, by asking for further and better, it means that whatever you have given is clearly insufficient. It's not enough for the president to say, look, I will assure having a free and credible election in 2023. 20, uh, what are the facts on ground? I would have expected a situation where the president uh, will go further and probably say, look, I will sign the electoral amendment bill, which has made some level of uh, improvement on our electoral uh, system, uh, which he refused to sign the last time uh, before the current, the, that last election, because of the fact that it was too close, uh, going by uh, the statement he made. He didn't say of signing that particular bill or he is going to ask the National Assembly to, you know, ensure that that bill is passed and probably uh, uh, brought for him uh, to sign. He didn't mention that. He cannot also be in the place of INEC probably to deal with the issue of operational inefficiencies, which has actually plagued INEC over the years. You think INEC is operationally ineffective? Of course, what, what happened in the last two elect I mean, the last election that took place, you know, concerning two states, it saw what happened in Kogi and what happened in Bayelsa. Even before that, uh, the 2019 election was clearly a retrogression. We didn't make much improvement, unlike that of 2015, which was a marked difference, you know, and an improvement in our electoral process. We went, we went back to Egypt in 2019 with, with regard to our electoral history. We didn't make much improvement. What do you think informed that? Then, then, then thirdly, he did not address the issue of the, the, the desperation of the political elite. What actually uh, causes what you call the electoral malpractice? The togri is the desperation. And what causes the desperation is what is available for public office holders when they get into office. And I've said it here. I don't know why we as a nation cannot, you know, it's a serious matter, this issue of electoral issue. It's a matter that all of us must sit down to really, you know, look as a very big problem. Because without a free, fair and credible electoral system, you cannot get the kind of leadership that can drive this country to the promised land. And that is the truth. So it's a very big problem. We keep on making one step forward and then several steps backwards in our electoral journey. We've not been able to do something you can say, look, we have remained consistent. What is, what, what is keeping us from Beautiful. This? You talked about Sogri and all of that. One of the issues that a number of people have also raised as far as this matter is concerned is the political elite. Now, you, 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 when you talk about Sogri, what exactly are you saying? Beautiful. Now... The political office uh, uh, contestant or whoever wants to be in political office, you know, looks at what is available in the Nigerian system for him before he contests an, for an office. And because of what is available, and it's so much, the packs of office, the, the, the institutions are so weak that do not monitor them. When they get into office, you, you are already made. So because of that, they are ready to do anything, I or anything, in order to get into that office. And we have not been able to address it. 
And I tell you this, as long as we don't address the issue of pegs, if what people are entitled to when they get to office, where the system is so weak and lax and do, do not in any way curtail, there are no checks and balances in order to ensure that when you get to office, what you're entitled to is only your salary and probably your allowances and not being accessible, you know, having so much access to the treasury. It becomes your ATM and you become a multi-millionaire, even for six months as a but governor. So the system does not check. We have institutions. Yes, uh, but they are weak. Stephanie. Yes, these institutions are weak. Okay, like the status of assemblies. What they're is supposed it? to What's, check. What makes in an institution weak? For Beautiful. instance, you know, uh, you, you talked about, uh, you know, the, the political office holder putting his hand into the till. There is a structure that is supposed to ensure that that does not happen. And there are structures that say, in, if, in the effect that that does not happen, that that does happen, there are structures in our system that says, okay, that's corrupt practice, there's an ICPC, there's an EFCC. So what is it that is making those things happen? The system from beginning, the fund, when, when the foundation be destroyed, the Bible says there is nothing the righteous can do. The people that actually manage to be in public office are the wrong set of people because of the electoral, you know, then, I'm, coming again, now, I'm coming now, sir, I'm coming, sir. The people that become status of assembly members are not the people that are going there to go and serve. What they are there is, what are we going to get? What is in there for us? So the moment they get in, they are not interested in checkmating the governor. They are not interested in carrying out their responsibility of ensuring that the governor does not in any way, you know, do things that are contrary to the law. No, they are not interested in that. What they are interested in is, what will the governor? And the governor knows how that these guys that are there are not really for service. He gets the speaker he wants and then negotiate with the speaker who do not in any way monitor his budget, who do not in any way monitor his expenditure, who do not monitor anything he does, including this issue of local government council we've been talking about, Ayo. We're saying that the constitution provides that every state must ensure a democratically elected local government administration. Is there in the constitution? But we have a situation where these governors, you know, take a pride in appointing caretaker, let me finish, Ayo, appointing caretaker committee chairman and the system pays allocation to illegal local government administration. The system does not say, look, if you don't get a government that is elected, I'm not going to you know, release the monthly allocation to those local government. So the system keep on encouraging the illegality, and the governors tamper with this, this, this money that belongs to local government. I will be sending it over here. Can't we get it right? So it also has to do with the issue of electoral system. The kind of people that get into, electoral, you know, into the system are people that are wrong. They do all manner of things in order to get in there. They manipulate. They use talk green. They use... All they even kill. Bison How many deaths occurred in Baeza State? How many deaths occurred even a woman was killed in Kogi? Bison Has Bison. somebody been prosecuted? So what I'm saying in effect, let me, let me learn Ayo, is this issue that the foundation is said from beginning to the end has always been very shaky and we have not been able to get it tried. Right. Now that the president is addressing the issue, which is very commendable, and I think we need to see that apart from saying I will not allow, I will assure. You don't assure when there are no facts on ground. You have not signed the amendment law. Let, you have let, not addressed let, other let, issues no, that will make this, a let, credible let, election. Let's yes. This further, Barry, so yes. yes. So you said that the, the right people are not in government. Yes. Whose responsibility is that? Some people vote them into power. No. Some the, people, uh, uh, there are people there at the ward levels. Maybe, it, maybe the constraint then is in the absence of what is... Uh, right, what is available is, is, is what we use. What, you don't blame the politician for being in office if somebody, some people voted them in. No, my problem is that most people that are actually in elective office are not actually voted by the people. And that is the truth. They, they come You're in saying the, that most the of electoral them, system yes. that we have, you know, the figures that the, the, the figures that INEC announces are not correct? Most times, they are not reflective, you know. I was a participant in 2019 election. I, I'm not the person that probably, you know, I, I wasn't in the field. I was in the field. I manned a political polling unit. And I saw all the kind of desperation. I was threatened. I saw gone from a, a voter. If I saw gone. Throughout the entire time that I was there, it was one war or the other, you know, we keep on averting those, you know, the fighting and, you know, manipulation, even carrying up the developed buses. I was in the polling unit from morning, from 8 o'clock till when the results were announced. If you see the kind of war, you know, that, you know, broke out and we tried as much as possible to, 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 to mellow them down, then when they finished counting and wrote the result, it is another tug of war because you have to follow them 
to the collation center. Because between the time they have written the result at the polling unit to the collection center, result changes. And really, despite the fact that we followed up, result also changed at the collection when we got to the local government. So, so it is a, a real war. So the, electoral, the electoral officers one, also one, are easily one, compromised. One moment. We'll, we'll come to the electoral process. Now, who, who the electoral officers will come to that. Who are the people that need to be educated as far as these issues that you have raised are concerned? You said the figures change yes. along the, yes. the way. Yes. Who changes them? The electoral officers. Because of the compro so because, of the, because of the because of the Yes. Ha. In fact, when, in my in my polling unit, what happened was when we finished the election, we discovered that many people did not actually, you know, come out. And they came with several documents, the electoral materials for the electoral purpose. So they now reach out to the electoral officers and say, look, we cannot allow these particular sheets you know, to be destroyed. Can we now begin to allocate results? An electoral officer called me and said, can we do it this way? Let's agree, agree among yourself how much we should allocate to each political party. I said, why would you do that? As long as this, this particular sheet is not used, then you, you tear it. The issue of allocating results when people have not come out to vote is wrong. It doesn't make sense. But he's telling me that's how it's been done. The electoral officer told me that's been done. Because INEC official. I mean, yes, yeah, INEC official told me that's how it's been done. When you go to a particular you know, uh, area and then election you know, process ends, if you discover you have so many materials still outstanding, I mean, you have not used, that the right thing to do is to allocate result to political party, even when people have not come out to vote. That carrying out these things is not good. It's not even good for our own polling unit because it also shows maybe that we probably lied about the population. So you yeah, say you following INEC officials collude to assign votes Don't make it look as if you are just, no, are, you, are you coming from the I'm, mass? I am not. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I'm, I'm telling you what goes on. Okay. They collude. Okay. And then, and now when you, when they declare the result, when they declare the result, the, the, of course, the next thing is that they ask you to go to court. And of course, you go to court, the judicial system also places a very heavy burden on you, the petitioner to disprove that the election announced by INEC is not correct. So you, it's, a, it's another, another decision. So most times, the, 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 the respondent is the one declared the winner. I mean, the one that you have, you are, you are, you are really, you petition against in the tribunal. Already, he has been declared winner by INEC, and you are the one now contesting. So the system now places a very heavy burden that you must be able to prove that that electoral process was, was invalid. And it's a heavy body, body on you, especially when you allege criminality. They say you have to prove in your reasonable doubt. And that's why you see all the results. Even though you saw the electoral system was very faulty, the results are validated by the judiciary. So it is a law, another tug of war. So by the time you finish that process, if you're a genuine you know, a, a public a, a prospective office holder, I mean, who wants to be a, a, a politician, would you want to go and waste your money at the end of the day when you know that, one, you don't have much money anymore to, 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 comp to get the system now to vote for you, and the people that have the money will compromise the entire system. And when you go to judiciary, the judiciary places a heavy body. So you find out that we are not getting even the right kind of leadership. Okay. Our electoral system drives away those righteous people, those that want to put Nigeria in the 21st century map, you know, are not coming forward because okay. the system do not allow, they makes it impossible for them. Okay, we'll take this further. That you, these things that you said about INEC, they have to be able to respond themselves. So let's go to Maupai in Abuja for this response. Well, thank you, Ayo. We have with us in the studio Mr. Uluwale Osaze Uzi, who is Director of Voter Education and Publicity at INEC. You're welcome to Sunrise Daily. Thank you for having me. Good morning. Good morning. Well, you have seen uh, just what the president said to mark his 77th birthday. He says he'll ensure credible elections come 2023. Well, some people say, Mr. President, you don't have to look too far. The election's coming up uh, in Edo and um, is it Ondo next year? And of course, there'll be off-season elections again in 2021 as well before we yes. finally hit 2023. Yes. Nonetheless, I'm sure that this must be something that will cheer you up at INEC. Uh, the president's statement and his determination to ensure that elections are free and fair come 2023. The question will be, as INEC, if you were to make a request to the president saying, Mr. President, in line with this, your commitment, uh, what requests will be on your, on your sheet of paper? Uh, what would you like Mr. President to do? What do you think are within his powers to do to ensure uh, that come 2023, would you not have excuses uh, for any lapses that could occur during the electoral process? 
Well, thank you. Um, first of all, he has started on, if I may say so, on the right track. Uh, it's important that um, uh, all stakeholders pay, play their part. He has started in the sense that he has made his views known so that it's, it's, it's a message that res should resonate with us. It should resonate with all stakeholders. It should also resonate. It's in, uh, it was directed at aspirants, uh, people who want to aspire to offices. That look, don't use my name. I'm not interested in favoring this side or the other side. What I'm interested in is ensuring the credibility of a process. And whoever that process turns out, so be it. So that's a positive thing. I thought that in 2015, the attitude of the then uh, President Goodluck Jonathan helped us a great deal because he not only made things up available, but did say his body language and his express expressions did say, look, my, uh, my, my being in office is not worth the blood of any Nigerian. I think those are positive statements. Contrary to the opposite would be things like, uh, uh, it's do or die, um, garrison commanders, uh, we must ensure we capture power, things like that. So first of all, the language. The language is very important to set the tone of things to come. And if you start from the head saying that, we hope that others down the line will follow suit. Then comes the next step, and that's why I say it's a start. Then your body language has is in common parlance in Nigeria these days, and your actions will have to demonstrate that you actually, it's not empty rhetoric, so you actually mean every word that you say. So you will support everything that will be possible to ensure the credibility, to ensure your, your promise is fulfilled. Where there is um, uh, electoral reform, for example, and the legislator does his own bits, then the executive has to also sign the bill into law. And if there are any areas that he feels that this may not be in the good of the country, return it to the legislature and say, look, please have a take a look at that. And when that has been addressed, then you should go ahead and, and sign the bill. That is another step. Um, addressing security agencies, for example, look, you are agencies of state. You are not agencies of government in power. You're not agencies of the opposition. You are agencies of state. You are to ensure you perform your constitutional responsibilities as you should. He appoints the uh, commanding officers, or at least the, the hierarchy of the, of the armed forces, for example, uh, sometimes subject to certain checks and balances. But if you give matching orders to these people and, rea and they realize that if they don't act professionally, with integrity, and in a non-partisan way, you could lose your position, you could lose your office, and, and you can end up in ignominy and shame, then, and it, it risks the route act to them, then we think that we'll be, go there. Strengthen the institutions of state. Strengthen, let people do things in a non-partisan way. In a, provide the resources that are necessary for you to achieve your goal. So if each stakeholder, the president has done his own bit, if each stakeholder does, does their own bit, then I think that we will be on the right track. We have responsibilities, so do all other stakeholders. I like the fact that you mentioned uh, the body language and the, the right language. You said the president has started with using the right words yes. and that he will have to match it with body language and other, Actu you know, action. other actions that will come at the end of the day. And one of them you, you're talking about is the messaging to the security agencies. Absolutely. You do, would you say that it hasn't been as strong as it ought to have been, uh, you know, since 2015? Well, the uh, experiences in um, the, uh, especially last cycle of elections and, uh, and in some states during the general elections, the accusations and counter accusations, the experience in river states for the off cycle things and the run elections tells a slightly different uh, story. And um, observers and people have called, uh, called to question the neutrality and impartiality of certain state actors. And um, even where you're not uh, uh, questioning their integrity and non-partisanship, um, there are other non-state actors that seem to have an uh, open hand in certain places. So when you have a large deployment of, uh, of, 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 of forces, it's amazing that you still have um, wholesale violence in particular areas. So it means that although they might be professional and non-partisan, they've not been able to overwhelm the non-state actors who are bent on uh, impugning the integrity of the process. So that is a word something. So there are two issues. One, discharge your duties professionally and impartially. And secondly, make sure you contain the non-state actors who are bent on disrupting uh, the process. So do your duty of securing the environment. That's first of all, that's your constitutional and, and statutory responsibility. Secure the environment. Then let those who have other responsibilities that conduct of the elections do so in that kind of secure environment so that voters can come feeling secured that, look, one, their votes will count. That's where it comes in. But two, that they're safe to come out to cast their votes without let or hindrance. Well, the desperation of politicians is something that I'm sure worries INEC sometimes uh, and also maybe worries the electorate. Um, and you, you see the president here saying, 
Well, this is how New Telegraph quotes him. I'll frustrate desperate politicians in 2023. Only yesterday, a debate was held on the floor of the House of Representatives. I do not know if you followed that debate yes. uh, about single tenors for uh, members of the executive, both at the federal and at the state level. Yes. Uh, and some people say that this, is, this could be something that could cure um, you know, this desperation by politicians. Do you think it has any merit at all in that regard? First of all, I don't think one measure can cure all all the ills are uh, uh, process, uh, electoral process. I don't think uh, by saying, for example, that if they do it in one term, that's it. There, there are crises in states, for example, where issues of succession come in, even when the incumbents have exhausted their tenures. So um, single tenure, multiple tenure, I don't think it might ameliorate it, it might reduce it, but doesn't necessarily cure it. Check it out on al almost every state, the issues of succession is a problem. Even issues of second term is a problem, yes. It plays out, it's playing out presently in some states. But issues of succession have also been problems, problematic for our system. So I don't think it's a silver bullet. But yes, um, every suggestion has its own merits. But we must analyze, take a critical look at all the suggestions. Look at the pros, look at the cons. And by the time you weigh the two, often the cons are worse than the pros or the pros are worse than the cons. So you now do a balancing act and say, which in our own system, taking an in-depth and critical look at it, which one is better for us. Uh, we should not look at things perfunctorily. We shouldn't look at things on the surface and just say, look, uh, this system is not working, so throw the baby, throw the bathroom, throw everything away, let's start all over again, let's reinvent the wheel. That doesn't necessarily solve the problem. And first of all, and most importantly, is the mentality, the mental attitude of the people and their perception of things and their desperation for uh, power. Those are things that um, you don't change overnight, and those are things that legislation per se, in, by itself, cannot necessarily uh, change. But considering just how, you know, it affects you, I mean, the fact that this is, the elections usually are a winner takes it all. And oftentimes that comes to play in the measures. So sometimes no matter how, no matter what measures INEC comes up with to try and ensure that the process is free and fair, you find people always coming up with other ways to try and circumvent the process because Absolutely. what is at la what is at stake is, is very huge, so, so to speak. Yes. So. Are there, have there been any measures that you were looking at to try and get politicians to calm down and say, look, you know, this cake will eventually go around, or maybe this cake is going to be good for the good of all Nigerians. It shouldn't be for the, uh, for the political office holder. Are there any measures that INEC is looking at long term, considering just how heated our politics becomes and just how desperate, uh, you know, measures to try and circumvent the process becomes? First of all, let me say I like your analogy of the cake going around, and you quickly um, try to uh, suggest that it's not just cake going around to the political office holders, but to all Nigerians. And I think that's where part of the problem is. Um, first of all, the cake has to be baked. You have to have sufficient ingredients to, big, to bake a large enough cake that will go around. And unfortunately, um, many of our uh, office holders tend to see the cake as they are the master bakers of the cake, and they are entitled to take a larger chunk of it often to the detriment of the uh, citizens of Nigeria. Yes, there are measures that we try to put in place, but you see, there's not one measure you can say will solve everything. Long term, we think there has to be attitudinal change. Whether that's the responsibility of INEC is a different thing. Prior to 2006, INEC was not responsible for voter education, for example, not statutorily anyway. Um, other agencies uh, like NOAA and such like agencies, MDAs, have that responsibility, Minister of Information, NOAA, such like agencies have that responsibility, then civil society take it upon themselves, educating the public, educating Nigerians, educating the leaders, because they need uh, enlightenment and education in terms of, look, this thing should be service, all about service, not all about selfish things. It's difficult where there's greed and there's poverty. You know, it's very, it's, it's a terrible combination and um, it's difficult to do so, but we must continue to not necessarily preach, but using tools of voter education, voter enlightenment, and saying the better good of society, enlightened self-interest. It is better for you and generations coming that we should be more altruistic in our approach towards all these uh, issues. Impunity, we must tackle impunity. While we're doing education, we'll say, what can we do in terms of punishing those who are guilty of infractions of the law? Punishing them, the political will has to be there. What can we do so that it's not a rewarding enterprise? You don't reward bad behavior. You punish it. So enlighten you that, look, this is the right way to go. Then if, but if you uh, very, very of that, that, that track, then you'll be punished. 
And then you now look at the punishment. Is it worth it to veer off? So you're encouraged because it's the right thing to do. You're punished if you veer off that uh, track. So there are lots of these issues. So that's where the electoral reform and um, measures towards ensuring less impunity are put in place. Mm -hmm. But there's, there's, a, there's an issue of um, big manism, if I may use that term, that's in Nigeria, that look, um, the political will is not there to enforce laws against the big man, against the, the, the leaders of our society. So, mm -hmm. Yes, that's, that's a problem. But, but that increases the list of things for the president to do. If <laughs> elections should be free and fair Absolutely. in Absolutely, but not just the president. Yeah. Because it takes more than the president. And well, I think but as, as the leader, yes, yeah. he does, he does. But a lot of impunity going on in the States is not, it's not up to the president. So because of the federalism and the division and responsibilities of powers, he cannot deal with everything. But he sets the tone. The head has to be right. Once the head is right, hopefully, others will fall into place. But yes, he has a huge responsibility. The president is not responsible for CX, for example, state independent electoral commissions. They yeah. conduct their own elections. Mm -hmm. So the electoral process is not just about INEC. It's also about stakeholders. Local Qu government elections are an issue. Quickly, I want you to respond to what Mr. Obani was talking about when INEC officials themselves collude with, uh, pub with, um, with politicians, especially with results. Uh, you heard what he said there. I want you to quickly respond to that. Well, I cannot um, join issues with my colleague for personal experiences uh, of his. Mr. Bani has uh, related a personal experience, although they are mixed uh, um, and somewhat uh, not so clear explanations to things. For example, we talk about results and saying we write results, we change the results and things like that. There's usually only one result sheet in the polling units. But yes, there are incidences of head of things that look ballot papers come and there's community connivance in all this. Often, we send a young uh, a youth copper there, a 22, 23-year-old boy or girl to go and conduct elections. And the community comes and okay, we have used them um, one quarter, only 25% or 30% or 40% turnout. Let us utilize some of these other materials. And the community puts pressure, or at least those immediate people, not just the general community, they put pressure on the poor chap who is not so well protected. And then says, look, you must do it this way. We've had incidences of that, and then it changed things. But he seems um, completely, he doesn't seem to trust the system as um, being able to correct some of those things. But we have corrected some of those things, actually. Mm -hmm. And it's where with the use of a card reader, it becomes increasingly more difficult to utilize materials when you have not gone through biometrics of a card reader. Well, we'll continue to hope and, well, work. I don't want to say pray. We have to work. Indeed. If we want something, we have to work for it. Absolutely. And, you know, work like our lives depended on it. Absolutely. We have to thank you it for does. coming <laughs> on Sunrise Early this morning. Credible Polls has been our discussion, and we've been speaking with Mr. Oluwale Osaze Uzi, uh, who is the Director of Voter Education and Publicity at INEC. Sunrise Early continues in a moment. Please stay with us. We're still talking about credible polls as uh, an issue that many people are really concerned with. And uh, Barrister Mondi Obani is still here with us this morning. So going forward, what do you propose we do? Uh, so everyone has talked about all the things. We've talked about the electoral bill and talked about security. And so what are the things that we must do urgently? The next uh, Stargate election is uh, happening next year. Yeah. You know, we, we saw the, the elect, election that took place in Britain uh, at the last week. Uh, we, we saw it's a model. We didn't see the army. We didn't see the police. People, out of their evolution, you know, went to the polls, you know, cast their vote. And the election, within 24 hours, the results were declared. No date, you know, were occurred. You know, these are models. Even after our own election, other countries have had a conducted election, and we watch how those results and the electoral process, you know, went. We should, we should try as, as much as possible to emulate. And I'm saying this, it's no question of probably, you know, giving one solution that will solve all our electoral problems. We, we have issue, but let's first of all deal with that fundamental: the issue of what people get to be entitled to when they get to office. Between me and you, Google does, does not forget. As long as we don't deal with perks of office, what people, you know, entitled when they get office. We may not be able to get the kind of right leadership because then we just mess up the ele entire electoral process. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about the wrong people, you know, trying to emerge. In that issue of desperation, they will want to because of what is ultimate for them. So, so let's deal with that. If you how do we deal with that? Fine, as a country, there is nothing wrong in saying, look, if you are coming in as a governor, let's define what the governor is entitled to. Do you know, as I speak to you today, governors are entitled to so many things. 
including tampering with local government for I've said it, in, including when they award contract, you know, there is no proper, you know, evaluation of contract. A particular road now you do in your state, you know, a very, the same, you know, uh, uh, environment is one billion. Another person will do it for five billion. No, there's no standard. So we must deal with this issue of security vote. These guys use all that security vote to steal our money. And no, up to now, nobody has stopped it. So as long as these guys are entitled to, to these things, they will never allow you to have a credit. Even when you do the, electro the electronic system, they will still mess it up. And you, just, just mark my word, eh? even if we do everything electronically, these people, because of the desperation, because of what is in stock for them, they will mess up the entire system. How, so can we sort it out at that level? And I'm saying now, the let's define what they're entitled to. I've said it now, are you not hearing me? Okay, if let's we, define what these guys are entitled one, one, to. One moment, yes. Mr. Bani. Let's say we determine it. Yes. How do we enforce it? How do we determine it? How do we enforce it? Because it, they, it's the National Assembly. Yeah, it starts the RMAFC with, is there. Yeah, we have any mobilization. It starts with the leadership, with, you know, with the president. You know, it's, that's why I said that the president making that statement is very good. He has just said, but he needs to go further than that. He starts with the presidency showing example of what true leadership is supposed to be. That are coming, I'm not interested in money, I'm interested in service. You find out that the right kind of people will begin to emerge in this nation who also will be interested in service. And of course, they will be elected, not because of the fact that people have given them money. The people, the electorates will not, you know, begin to ask for money. They say, we know this man, when he, or this woman, when she goes there, when he goes there, he's going to give us good leadership. They will begin now to change. Orientation is also very key. But let's get it right with the presidency first. Who shows example? I'm not interested in security vote. I'm not interested. You know, it begins to live by example. Then other governors will follow suit, you know. But why the system up is wrong? The system below also will be wrong. So let leadership at the highest level get it right. We've not been interested in money, not been interested. They are only interested in service. When we get it right with that leadership, you find out that the electoral system will be right. But if you don't get it right with what people are entitled to, they will mess up the electoral. Mark my words. We may never get it right with electoral system if we don't deal with what people are entitled to when they get to office. It's my, it's my solution. I have found it a long time, and I've said it on channels, that you will never have free and fair election in this country, despite anything we will do with the times of electoral reform, if we don't define what people who come into office are entitled to. Okay. Uh, just let's take yeah. you, yes. your, your opinion on this one last yes, thing. You see the front page of the uh, papers this morning, the House of Representatives rejecting the single tenure of six years for the president and governors. What's your mm -hmm. take? Maybe why they rejected it is this insinuation that they may not be specific as to people who are already in power. They may, may be a sort of a tenure elongation, but for the presidency and some governors are not. That's why some people raise some meanings. It's, it may be something that is worth experimenting. Maybe one time, tenure, six, months, six years, after you finish, you go. It's something that we should, but we must define it in a proper manner and do a lot of education. I'm not saying it may solve all our problems, so, but it is something that is worth, you know, you know, okay. you know, looking at, you know. But because of the fact that there are people who are already in power, and there is this rumor that this may be another tenure elongation, that's why it was rejected in total. Okay. Another thing. We have to thank you very much for being a part of our conversation this thank morning. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, Barrister Monde Ubani is a legal practitioner and uh, second. Vice President. Former. Of, former second Vice President of the Kenya NBA. Thank no, you so Nigerian Bar Association. Nigerian Bar Association. Nation. <laughs> Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Right, we throw this back to Abuja. Malpe has another guest on another issue entirely that concerns you. Stay with us.